Welcome to part B, the second lecture of John lecture 15. We have gotten through the outline. We have gotten through the trial scene with its three parts that are being played, looking at a couple of the major themes. And now we want to look at the crucifixion and burial, and perhaps even the empty tomb passages as we look at this section. And so as we begin looking at the text and the story, we have the crucifixion account and the episodes in there beginning in verse 16, right? He handed him over to be crucified. So I took Jesus and took him to a place called Golgotha in Hebrew and crucified him. So the Roman uh, sentence of death not carried out on Roman citizens because they felt it was too degrading, carried out with a vengeance to bring submission of the peoples who saw this very blatant way of just essentially allowing someone to suffocate to death, to hang in shame in the um, public places for people to see them so that others who see this would avoid uh, being perhaps found guilty enough of the crime. But it was a low, uh, lowly execution method. But the irony is, Pilate puts an inscription for everyone to see that says, Jesus the Naz of Nazarene, I'm sorry, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, the I-N-R-I -I in Latin, because it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek, so that everyone would know that this person was dying as the King of the Jews. So this whole idea that goes through John is that Jesus is this king. Now, the Jewish leaders were upset because they didn't want him to be recognized as the king of the Jews. But Pilate says, I've written what I've written because it is a idea that brings submission to these Jewish leaders. So they've already admitted that they have no king but Caesar. And so the fact that they are crucifying Jesus as king of the Jews means any future hope of a king is gone because the king has been crucified and no one is left to follow after him. It could also be a statement that this is... Uh, what Pilate finally finds Jesus guilty of. But in the Roman world, no king would be crucified. They would have been brought to uh, Rome as a triumph. So there's a lot of irony in this little death scene as recorded in John. We have the concept after some of the episodes that Jesus actually becomes thirsty. Right? They give him some sour wine, some vinegar perhaps, but something that's just, it's there to help alleviate the pain perhaps, but the idea of Jesus thirsting in light of the themes in the gospel is mm, paradoxical because we can look at John chapter four where he talks with the woman at the well and he tells her that he can fulfill her thirst. We have the bread of life where they hunger and thirst for him. They eat his uh, body and drink his blood. And we have chapter 7 where he says at the um, festival of tabernacles just six short months before, if anyone is thirst, come to me and I will give him drink. But here, this one who offers to quench the thirst of others 
is now thirsty. And then in another use of that word paradidomy, he hands over his spirit. He gives it over. So this word is playing a very important role in this particular section. So Jesus has died. It is midway through the afternoon hours, about the ninth hour. The, the Romans uh, schedule their calendar by, or their day by the sunlight to sunset. And they were divided into 12 hours of the daytime and 12 hours of the nighttime. And so uh, three quarters of the way through, Jesus is dead. And, but it's a very sacred holy day. And the Jews don't want these crucified people uh, to defile the scenery around Jerusalem. So they asked Pilate to go ahead and show the mercy and not let them just hang on the cross for several days as they suffocate in pain and sadness. But when they come to Jesus, he is already dead. And to be certain that he's dead, they have the unique sign that he a soldier stabs the side of Jesus, not told in Matthew, Mark, or Luke, only talked about here, right? And then a passage quoted, or this death of Jesus is fulfilling passages as the early church looks back and understands scripture more. But this is a very sacred day the religious leaders who have come to Pilate are concerned for the religious purity, not only of themselves, because they would not go into the praetorium, but also of those passing by these suffering uh, individuals. But what then happens? Joseph of Arimathea goes to Pilate as well and asks if he might take away the body. And so Joseph, a very important person who has the uh, standing to address Pilate of a request, defiles himself to take the body of Jesus and bury it. And who is with him? Nicodemus mentioned who had first come to him by night so we're tying this into the story into chapter three Pilate willingly defiles himself to take on a status that will not allow him to participate in the passover ceremonies in order to bury jesus and they bring a mixture of myrrh and aloes almost a hundred pounds weight as they address it in other words, fit for a king, these spices. And they place him in a tomb, and then it is almost evening. So, the burial of Jesus. Is Nicodemus faithful? Well, the interesting is he is one of very few characters outside of the disciples of Jesus who show up at different points in the story of Jesus. He shows up in chapter 3. He shows up in chapter 7. He may show up unnamed among many of those who uh, do not agree with the Pharisees' mainstream or wanted to hear Jesus out. And he shows up here where he is willing to defile himself in order to bury Jesus and not celebrate the Passover. So then, the darkness has come. It is a day later. For those who are wondering about how we get the third day, the number zero had not yet been invented. And so anytime we counted, we would start with the day we are on. So today is day one. That would have been the Friday. From sunset Friday till sunset 
on Saturday would have been day two, and day three would have been after sunset on Saturday. And it's now morning, so the hours of the night have passed, and we have Mary Magdalene coming to the tomb while it is still dark. Very interesting thing, statement there. The light has not yet shown on the day, and to their knowledge, Jesus has not yet been resurrected. But it is still dark, and Judas went out while it was dark. But then we have the um, unknowingness. The stone was taken away, and Mary doesn't know what to do, so she runs to find some disciples. She finds Simon and the other disciple, the beloved disciple, is referred to him. So we don't say the other disciple whom Jesus loved. The beloved disciple, sometimes BD, is the abbreviation given for that. And they say, uh, his body's gone. We don't know where they took him. Well, that's of concern because these people want to be faithful to Jesus, don't want his body to be defiled, and they run back to the tomb. And when they get there, they look in, and there is no body, but there are linens. And they weren't quite sure what they should do because they didn't understand scripture. They did not understand scripture, that he must rise again. They did not understand his words as he taught them about resurrection. So they just go back to their own homes, the places where they are staying. And Mary sticks around. And as Mary sticks around, right? She encounters Jesus in verse 11. So, moving into the next section, she is weeping. She is crying. And finally, looks into the tomb up to now, the story has not said she has looked in there. When she looks, she actually sees two angels sitting there. Not recorded that Peter saw the angels, not recorded that the beloved disciples saw the angels. They just saw the linens. And they say, why are you crying? And she said, because the body has gone. Don't you know? I don't know where they've taken him. And they say, he haven't taken him. And then the voice says, woman, why are you weeping? The exact same words. Why are you weeping? She says, they've taken the body. I don't know where he is. At which point Jesus says her name. And upon hearing her name, right, she recognizes Jesus and calls him rabbi, a Hebrew term, beloved teacher. So she thinks the body is gone, but the linens the burial linens are still in the tomb so if <clears throat> he was gone they had to unwrap the body and take the body with them which just doesn't actually make sense but if you were to encounter resurrection you too might be a little bit wondering at that and at which point he says please stop clinging to me I still must go ascend to the Father and return. But go tell the brethren, those who believe in me, those who are gathered, that I will, I have been resurrected. Well, that's probably enough for this particular lecture. So we'll pause and